Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm here to usher you in into the city of Missoula and beyond in the world today with some news, some pre-critic, where I prejudge a movie whether it needs it or not. I got a little bit of dubbing stuff for today as well from the Yesterday Machine, because I all know that we wish that yesterday would come back again, the old yesterdays of years past. <laughs> Um, and also a bunch of other stuff that are happening. Let's dive right in. Kicking things off with a uh, COVID president, a virtual debate, a democratic plot. Um, <laughs> you might already know a lot of these big news stories that have been happening all week long, but I usually tape these on Thursday, so I missed the big uh, COVID uh, test positive reveal of President Donald Trump, which he spent three days in Walter Reed Medical Facility with very minor... Um, symptoms and uh yeah he basically was in and out and what the um, doctors would and himself call like a medical cocktail to help him kind of revive and you know when you have the best uh um medical science at the top uh a top office in the united states it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to be just all right um but of course speaking of back to the debate um according to health officials and other uh the uh uh, let's see, the big thing is that they're looking to uh, make the debate between Trump and Biden on October 12th virtual only, which uh, Trump says that is a Democratic plot to cover the election, and he wants a more traditional town hall meeting. In other news, Vice President uh, Mike Pence and uh, uh, candidate uh, Kamala, Hollis, uh, Kam Kamala Harris uh, went at it um, the other night. Um, and honestly... Uh, there wasn't really much to talk about. Um, it was a uh, from uh, what people uh, mentioned. It was a pretty typical debate between the two. Uh, Kamala uh, attacked Pence and the administration for how of the handling of COVID nineteen. Um, Mike Pence went to say that they did all they could, and a lot of this was uh, inevitable um, in in some ways and somewhat. And uh, let's see here. Um, what else did he say? Pence said that Harris's tax and plans are taking advantage of those who have suffered uh, from the virus for political gains. And of course, I'm not going to get too much into the vice presidential debate because this week, um, especially today, uh, Trump announced that he would not appear in the virtual town hall debate. Trump said he would not debate if virtual and wants the town hall meeting type format. The commissioner of, of the presidential debates, um, let's see, Frank, uh, Frankenkampf, said um, there's uh, said that to protect the health and safety of all involved after Trump's pro positive COVID-19 diagnosis of subsequent uh, White House outbreak. Um, the ball is in Trump's court in regards to hosting the debate virtually, but would not allow for in-person debates. Uh, the COVID incubation period, as you may know, is two weeks. Um, October 12th would go against the CDC guidelines of the two weeks quarantine uh, for, uh, and it would be too risky. Perhaps we may actually see an uh, in-person debate on the 22nd, which would be the last debate between uh, um, challenger Joe Biden against incumbent President um, Donald Trump. Of course, uh, I recently read a story uh, in New State that Montana has had the most expensive Senate race between incumbent Steve Daines and Governor Bullock in Montana's history with over $75 million. The Waysland um, Media Project, which tracks political ads on TV, also said that the race between U.S. Senator Steve Daines and uh, Democratic Governor Steve Bulk has more than has more TV ads aired since Labor Day weekend than any Senate contest in the nation. Um, why is uh, Little Montana so important? Uh, one of the things is that a senator's vote is very important, for sure. Um, and let, if we dive a little bit deeper, uh, each state is a, basically a guaranteed two senates, two senate seats, which means two votes in the senate. And because of that, you have uh, states that have fluctuating populations, while the senate is uh, pretty stagnant with two people per state. Montana has a fairly low population, so low that we only have one Congress uh, person representing all the state of Montana and all the populace, and most of them are based on the population densities and places and whatnot. So uh, places like New York have uh, two senators uh, with eight million, more than eight million people in the state, and Montana's voting has about one million people uh, for the two senators. And uh, New York senators are not more powerful than Montana state senators. So that's what makes Montana such a big swing state 
over the nations, um, and also Wyoming is another big one as well. Uh, each state, like I said, each Senate vote is worth the same one vote. A vote that represents all of Montana is the same as the votes that represents all of New York's population. Think about that as Montana uh, um, continues their swing state status in the future. So that's just one thing to kind of think about, about how uh, kind of weird and interesting just the Senate um, part of uh, Congress is. But I'm not going to get too much. I, I already got enough into it. But let's go back to more um, how... Montana is dealing with COVID. So that's a big news item because just in the last week we have uh, COVID cases have jumped up 40% in the state of Montana and most of those in Yellowstone and Flathead counties. Um, hospitals are filling up with 235 people in the hospital ward of the of COVID wards in the, across the state of Montana. Some think there should be some kind of stay-at-home order, uh, but Governor Steve, Steve Bullock has urged uh, um, many people to seek advice from local public health officials and that um, it's hard for him to control many counties from Helena. Um, that's what he just said. Um, Montana Department of Health and Human Services are in charge of statewide COVID-19 care. Many um, county health departments are working hard, contact tracing, close contacts, and providing limited testing for people who are at high risk. Of course, those are some of the news items. Uh, I got a lot of other stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, the city of Missoula is looking to um, for continue forwarding um, banning of flavored uh, cigarettes and uh, uh vape juice and so they're going to be talking about a little bit about this during city council later in my show but for right now i got uh, a bunch of new programs I'm going to be earning an mcat followed by some um free critics so stay with me <laughs> So uh, we are actually one of only a few uh, transit agencies in this country, the uh, university transit, that is operated and governed by students. Uh, we have 25 currently uh, student drivers working part-time. We put, put them through a paid CDL training. A lot of them like that because then they go on and fight fires in the summer. Why do they all look so happy? Well, partly because they're the highest paid student employees on campus. They have a very flexible job that works around their schedule. Uh, and it's just a really fun job, and you get to serve a good purpose for the community. Uh, um, all kinds of things. You can have the flu in the middle of flu season. So the issue of getting out to vote, before we really had the broad access to absentee or just generalized vote by mail, was that it really took an effort. You didn't get off of work if you were low income. That meant that a lot of lower income people who were working in uh, some jobs, really, it was too difficult for them to get to uh, a polling place to vote. So they were discouraged uh, from voting. So what's really happened for many people in the most rural parts of our state is that for some of them they would have to drive 10, 20, 30, 40 miles to get to a polling place in terrible winter conditions with maybe a car that wasn't reliable, etc., or it didn't fit with their work schedule, and so they didn't vote.
guys. Welcome back. It's time for a little thing I like to call pre-critic. Uh, welcome to the hellscape world of lies that get out of control. It's a thriller. It's a killer. This movie sounds like Liar Liar Pants on Fire, which will literally be taken. Um, welcome to the movie entitled The Lie. When you have parents who will do anything to protect their murdering daughter, we get The Lie. Uh, followed by more shenanigans that force one of the parents to make the right decision and bring justice to their evil brat. Probably their uh, other parent is even more evil. That That's the reason why their child was evil in the first place, which makes it people think that it's like nature versus nurture, but actually it was nature that turned the child evil. But the good parent didn't know that the, the bad parent was doing this this whole time. But then things happen, and cover-ups, cover-ups. And then, and then things happen... And and then there's that kind of, uh, like any horror kind of thrill type movie, it's like, it's still kind of there. Just because I, we had the big climax doesn't mean it's over yet. The lie. That's what this movie is all about. Or am I lying? Who knows? Uh, console Wars. Uh, documentaries from basically all those uh, documentaries where they talk a little bit about, about how uh, video games were at war with each other and... How, uh, so, co Console Wars is kind of like a rehash of story of video games from when Nintendo basically uh, screwed over what would become Sony because they wanted to add a disk drive to their Super Nintendo and Sony's like, ugh, you're asking a lot and then like, Nintendo was like, blah, 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 and then they're just like, you know what, we're just going to do our own thing. Boom, Sony was born. But this is basically about Sega. So, you, you get a verse uh, Mario versus Sonic the Hedgehog and the two consoles and they basically get to see all this stuff. Um, I don't know. From arcades to riches, as they take on to Nintendo, um, Sega is the little guy who take on big Nintendo, and you kind of see how that turned out. Uh, they got really ambitious with the uh, the Dreamcast, but it, people just w weren't in it. They just weren't buying it or whatever. All right, speaking of video games, it's the time of the show where I talk a little bit about a video game. Uh, right now we got Star Wars Squadrons. So EA always likes to come out with like Battlefront type uh, pay to um, show off flair kind of games where you pay for the full price of the game, but then there's many microtransactions um, that you have to pay for uh, uh, the Millennium Falcon. Boom. That's just coming out of the top of my head. But EA Games brings another you release, another Star Wars Battlefront type game. But this game, you're in, you're stuck inside the cockpit. You don't get a third-person view of the ship, so you don't see really many two people behind you. So you're in the cockpit. You see all the devices and all the stuff. So they have that aesthetic down um, for you guys to get into it. You get in the cockpit. Get cocky. Yes. Um, <laughs> you're going to buy this because you like Star Wars, and Star Wars is your Bible. Um, anyways, enjoy all the classic battles from Frontline only to realize that it's harder to practice at anything in war games then destroy them uh watch another ea pay to play in this game after you buy all right so that does it for pre-critic i have uh, a little thing that we always wish we can go back to the old days and this is basically something that i've been doing every single week where i bring an old movie from the archives um from way back when where it's uh uh what's that called uh public domain and then I just read dub over it, and this is the newest episode of Dub and Stuff, The Yesterday Machine. Oh, Jeff, please uh, come in. How you doing? Well, you know, it ain't easy being a detective in a sci-fi movie, but I'm a trying. Best as I can. For that boat you will buy, I will love you. For all the stuff that you buy me tour today. Ah, yes. I just I just wanted to say thank you for watching me sing about my privileged privileged life. I'm rich. So It's not so hard being that privileged, I assume. I'll just pretend to feel guilty about it. <laughs> Lasagna. Now I'm a common. Madame, the police are here to talk to you. Oh. Um. Could you hide you the drugs You probably should not be saying that out loud, Monsieur. 
Oh, oh, these, oh, hi. Hello, ma'am. Wait for me. Sorry to bother you, but this is vital to our case. Like, extremely, extremely vital to our case. What do you think a rich singer like me can help you with? Well, first of all, I just got to say that you're quite the singer. <clears throat> okay, what does that have to do with anything? You know, you could have called. You didn't have to come all the way down here and interrogate me in person. Oh, you don't have to tell me how to do my job. I know how to do my job very, very well. <clears throat> yeah. So at the end of the interrogation, yeah, I was there. I was just like, you've just mm -hmm. been interrogated. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> hey, partner, you coming in? Alright, I'll uh, hold it, you two. I got a couple questions for you. I think I can handle this, Clifford. You going on without me. Oh, was he named after that uh, big red dog? Well, no. Oh, I see. So it was the Martin Short character in that one How movie. How did you know about that movie? I've never told anyone about it. It is a pretty good movie, after all. Martin Short. And yes, Charles Grodin should have gotten an Oscar for putting up with Martin Short. You and me? We're best friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, see you later. Wait a minute. I was supposed to capture him. As I've been speeding through my show, it's time to dive in and slow down with a little thing called City Council. This City Council was about two hours long, and primarily uh, they talked about some things here and there. Um, the city purchased a fairly expensive uh, 3D printer and scanner, um, but Stacey Anderson talks about this would be used for uh, first responders. This will have a direct impact on public safety, especially for the school children, because it will make scanned mo 3D models of all of our schools and will help our first responders train to, and God forbid, a situation ever arises where they need to um, go into the schools that they know exactly where all the in exits and entry points are, that they can train accordingly, they can um, get aid and personnel where they need to be to um, save children's lives. This directly impacts public safety and the lives of our children. This is used to make 3D scanning models of our schools and so that first responders can train and know exactly what the layout of all of our school buildings and classrooms are and egress in and out points. And so this is an excellent use of that money and I'm glad that the police department was able to get this grant because it will keep our community and the most important people, the children in our community safer. One of the many things that they can use is blueprints of buildings. Um, actually go to the buildings and find all the exits. I don't know. That's just me. It, <laughs> other than that, the city uh, opened grant fund for Trout Unlimited in its efforts to remove uh, and uh, basically restore the rattlesnake area where the dam was located um, and just restore the natural area. Um, so public, public comments were concerned for our incarcerated folks who don't have as access to COVID prevention, um, masks, and uh, treatment, and so so forth. For those of you who may or may not know, prisons are having uh, one of the largest outbreaks and having a lot of trouble with the virus as well due to overcrowding uh, in prisons and whatnot. Uh, up next, we're going to be talking about Title 20, which is an annual review slash update. This is uh, Title 20. Uh, the, you know, like, you know, a lot of times, the, like, you know, city council and a lot of stuff, they have, they throw a lot of numbers. Um, uh, ordinance uh, 2.7534. This one is very important for the city of Missoula as it's developing towards the future. Title 20 is something that you definitely got to remember because it's the um, basically downtown master plan about how the city of Missoula is growing, high density buildings, lower parking, and just trying to move forward with that. Um, most of the concerns, of course, is ADUs. And those are what's called, uh, otherwise known as, uh, uh, they're accessory dwelling units. But they're also called granny apartments because the original use of these was to basically um, build, a sh you know, out of the shed or garage, a new kind of apartment kind of complex for your grandma to stay with you before she, her, yeah. And so that was part of the, the city of Missoula moving forward on this, 2013. And it seemed to do a lot of draft work, redrafting, doing kind of things, sizes, um, and then grandfathering in a lot of... Um, different requests for a lot of people to build on their property these so-called ADUs, granny apartments. 
Anyways, let's get into the review of Title 20. Jen Gress from Development Services kicks things off. So in 2013, the City Council established Ordinance 30, uh, 3493, establishing standards for developing new ADUs with the intent to allow small-scale accessory residential that typically have minimal impacts in our community, while also providing new housing options. In spring 2018, the Title 20 was updated to remove the conditional use process for detached ADUs, making ADUs possible by right in all zoning districts. And over that timeline and up to this year, the city has seen an increase of three to four ADUs coming online per year, per year excuse me, with a current total of 30 ADUs having been permitted. Airbnbs have become very popular, and a lot of these ADUs have been used for Airbnbs, much to a lot of the renters of Missoula's uh, criticisms, saying that, oh, you're going to build a, 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 an extra apartment, but you're not going to rent it out to anybody who may need a place to stay and work while they are living in Missoula, but you're basically renting out to Airbnb, which is extremely part-time folks as well. So that was one of the things, um, and that has been altered a bit by you know diminishing the size of the uh, ADUs over the to over time is mu and much like that. Montana James from Missoula Housing and Community Development talks about the history of Title Twenty and how it impacts you. Um, so all the proposed changes in this round of the Title Twenty updates are supported by our office. Um, making, um, excuse me, Missoula's housing policy, a uh, place to call home, was developed over a two-year period during which we relied heavily on robust community engagement and really tapped the experts locally on housing, finance, construction, and code here in Missoula. And the resulting policy included over 30 specific recommendations to uh, improve housing affordability here in Missoula. So the ADU changes to Title 20 that you see before you are the direct result of that local community process. Needless to say, the city did move forward on this item. This is a part of public hearing, which will go on to, through throughout the rest of the weekend. Uh, this sort of will allow for diversity in terms of where people can rent and live in Missoula. This would overall help lower renting rates in Missoula. Um, sometimes you might get lucky. A lot of times, um, you, you know, you go to... Uh, property management places and they have a whole list of apartments for rent but then the, a lot of times this brings a, a, a necessary uh, diversity like they said to um, allow for more apartments to basically be built in people's backyards so they can rent, rent out to people sorry I'm very congested right now um, of course many of the issues about Title 20 as a whole tends to lean more towards reducing parking and discouraging motor vehicle use, but it's been hard to have a household without a car. Each person who moves into a place usually has a car. Um, Earl Allen, marketing manager at Mini Rooms. Uh, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Duh, duh, duh. Okay, so that actually pretty much does it. The city is moving forward. If you want to public comment on this as well for ADUs, you can talk a little bit more about that. But let's talk about one of the biggest things, uh, or uh, uh, kind of like a rehash of last year's uh, ban on flavored tobacco. Uh, last year, we saw a big shift in a lot of states moving forward on uh, reducing um, exposure for children to uh, have uh, like uh, like e-cigarettes, vape products, and also their uh, their juice, which uh, consists of many different flavors. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about them because they a lot of them sound like candy type flavors, which encourages a lot of kids to start those because they taste like candy, with also the additive of uh, the dangerous chemical nicotine tobacco products and whatnot. Um, Earl Allen, um, during this meeting, uh, is the marketing manager at Mini Noons in Missoula, and he talks about how the city should uh, about the city tightening efforts on vaping smoking products to her prohibit sale of flavored tobacco products. And this is what Earl Allen had to say. I'm not sure that the council realizes that the federal age limit went from 18 to 21 in December. And so a lot of the third party transfers and access to high schoolers and that kind of thing has changed uh, just in this year. Plus the FDA has had more regulations put in place, one federal court cases to actually pull and limit products and I'm not sure the council heard about that in detail. And I'm not sure we can properly cover it in just, you know, a couple, three minutes apiece here. So I would ask at the very least that the council return this to committee and, you know, work with those of us in the local retail community and get a better picture before moving forward. I mean, there's national things which create a level playing field. And those of us in ro local retailer, you know, feel that 
we need more of an opportunity to explain that because you know Missoula has the potential to offer the citizens, the customers, people who are, can buy these products. Um, it offers another reason for them to go out of the county. I mean, Florence is less than a half hour away, or out of state. Idaho is less than a couple hours away. So I think I think more of an open discussion is needed, and I would ask that at the very least, council return this to committee. For those of you who uh, don't know um, or should have known, but honestly, if you're over 21, you wouldn't really care too much about it. But the uh, legal smoking age for uh, the nation went up from 18 to 21 almost overnight um, when they decided to vote in December to up the age. And then it went into effect as of January of 2020, uh, which kind of kicked off the 2020 season. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Um, so uh, uh, let's see. Um, and so anyways, part of this um, age, um, moving the age up a little bit, was to add a little more separation between high school students and the flavored e-cigarettes. And so a lot of the tobacco companies can continue selling a lot of their um, flavored tobacco products. And so for the, for the, the next year, everything kind of went quiet and nobody noticed too much about, um, you know, bans on flavored tobacco products. But now that Missoula is moving forward with this, uh, John uh, Monahan, sales manager for Noon, wants it back to committee to have a deeper discussion. And primarily one of the issues that I have with it is the findings that are listed on the uh, proposal. Um, quite honestly, are, are really outdated and somewhat misleading. I think that we deserve an opportunity to defend ourselves against some of those claims. I personally take offense at finding number 19 that states that we place our products within reach of uh, candy and gum. And uh, that's not the case. Matter of fact, that is from a study in 2004. That's why I think it's somewhat misleading. Of course, John Monahan uh, went on to talk about the use of this ban, but not to reject it outright because they want to work with the city on this proposal. Um, they believe that they've been doing a great job at preventing sales to young children for the uh, flavored tobacco products. The city put this on the public hearing list for October 19th, and this was uh, basically kind of like a meeting after all their meetings to determine whether or not they wanted to put it on public hearing. And so they moved to put it on the public hearing, which would be on October 19th. And so, so far, so far, many people in the public comment section were business owners who feel targeted by this proposal because um, they have the most to lose when it comes to the banning of flavored uh, vape juice and so forth. There's a lot more public comments as well. There's a couple other business owners that uh, represent the sale of just the vape juice, um, and they were very concerned that this would basically take away their livelihood. Um, smoking is one of those things that is part of our culture that usually people usually say that this isn't the time to talk about these things. Every time it's brought up, there's always a public comment that says this isn't the right time to talk about these things. And a lot of the uh, comments that I've heard and people talking is that you're taking away people's uh, way of coping with stressful situations. And a lot of times smoking is a stress reliever for a lot of people who rely on it as, as well. Of course, um, not speaking for or against anything, but we all have to make our own decisions and our own health moving forward. Um, but that's as much as preachy as I'm going to get on this. And speaking of health, um, here is your latest update on the city's uh, city county health department talking about uh, what COVID's going on. And I talked Hi, my name is Cindy Farr and I'm the incident commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Wednesday, October 7th, and this is my daily briefing. First, I just want to let you know that I'm trying a different format today, so please forgive me if it's a little bit clunky. We've had 1,175 cumulative positive cases in Missoula County to date with 43 new cases since yesterday. We've had 752 recoveries and four deaths. Four Missoula County residents and four non-county residents are currently hospitalized in Missoula County. We now have 419 active COVID-19 cases and we've currently identified almost 1,200 close contacts. Those active cases and their known close contacts remain in isolation and quarantine and are being supported as needed. The state of Montana is reporting 16,063 cumulative COVID cases which is up 733 new cases from yesterday. That is a record number of cases being reported in one day in the state. There are now 5,352 active cases with 235 active hospitalizations across the state. 
and there have been 193 deaths related to COVID-19 statewide. The state website is showing Missoula County having 211 new cases overnight. Again, I just want to let everyone know that our local data is the correct data as there is a lag in what the state is reporting due to the way that they collect that data from us. The 211 cases are really just the state getting caught up. The University of Montana has had 207 cumulative UM associated cases since fall, the beginning of fall semester, which is up 15 since yesterday. And there are currently 101 active cases associated with the University of Montana. I know I've been asked to slow down a little bit when going through these briefings, especially when reporting the numbers. And I just wanted to let you know that while I can try to slow down when I can, I usually only have about 15 minutes to get the briefing prepared, recorded and uploaded between meetings. I'll definitely do what I can to try and slow it down a bit when I actually have the luxury of time. So next I want to share my screen and show you some of our data. So if we look at this, um, this particular graph, this is showing new cases by the date that they are reported to us. And as you can see, we've had a pretty steady incline. The blue line represents the seven day average um, of number of new cases being reported by day. This is showing our active COVID-19 cases in Missoula County in the past 60 days. This number is really important for us to watch here in Missoula County because what this graph is telling us or what the active cases is telling us is what's actually happening in our county right now compared to looking back at cumulative cases from the beginning of March. So this graph is showing our route of transmission for current active cases right now and as you can see 62 percent of our active cases right now have been confirmed to be the transmission came from being a contact close contact to a confirmed case about 34% have been had an unknown source, which would mean that it is community spread. Um, what we would like to see is this to hold steady where we're having a much smaller amount of community spread than um, than known contacts. So last week I talked a little bit about how um, when we see a spike in the 20 to 29 year old age range that within five to 14 days we're going to start seeing a spike in older ages as well and we are starting to see that shift now um, about a week ago with this uh, this 35 percent number the ages of 20 to 29 was about half of all of our active cases um, and these numbers were much smaller and so now what we're starting to see is that those numbers are starting to increase particularly in those um, groups that are over 50. So the only other new information that um, we'll be sharing today is related to how the disease is spread. The CDC updated guidance earlier this week saying that COVID-19 can sometimes be spread by airborne transmission. Until now, they believe that transmission only occurred through droplets. The biggest difference between these two is that with airborne transmission, the virus can linger in the air for minutes to hours if it's under the right temperature, ventilation, and humidity levels. There is evidence that under certain conditions, people with COVID-19 seem to have infected other people who were more than six feet away. These transmissions occurred within enclosed spaces that had inadequate ventilation, and sometimes the infected person was breathing heavily, for example, while singing or exercising. Under these circumstances, scientists now believe that the amount of infectious smaller droplet and particles produced by the people with COVID-19 became concentrated enough to spread the virus to other people. The people who were infected were in the same space during the same time or shortly after the person with COVID-19 had left. Available data to indicate that this available data indicates that this is that, that it is much more common for the virus that causes COVID-19 to spread through a close contact with a person who has COVID-19 rather than through airborne transmission. Even with this new information, the same precautions should be used. Physical physically distancing of at least six feet is most important. If you can keep more distance, that would be even more protective. Wearing face coverings, keeping your social circles very small, and hand, hand washing all still apply. Be sure to stay home and get tested if you develop any symptoms of COVID-19. And again, you can call 258-INFO to schedule a free test through our Flynn Lane Drive 
through facility. Um, just a heads up that our call volume is always really high on Monday mornings and on Fridays. So if you call on those days, you may have longer hold times. So that's it for my briefing today. As always, you can subscribe on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. -R. Click that notification bell so that you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Facebook at the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page. You can um, check out our new website at MissoulaInfo.com for lots of great, um, e more easily navigatable information there. And you can call 258-INFO if you want to schedule a test or if you are um, wanting just more information about resources that might be available to you or you have general questions about COVID-19. So until tomorrow, everybody, stay healthy. So from what I've been noticing on the CD County Health Department, um, especially Cindy Farr's um, YouTube channel, is that she has been posting on a more daily basis because she said she would as the uh, as there's more things happening with uh, COVID-19 um, in the county of Missoula and across the state of Montana as there's a sharp contrast a spike um, in cases of COVID as well um, moving forward into um, but of course, as always, you know, the, you know, how many more times do you have to hear wear a mask, um, plain and simple. A lot of businesses are required to wear a mask and stuff like that. But um, on also, um, if you run into a business and you feel as though they're not um, representing the city of Missoula's um, push to a curve COVID-19, you can call the Missoula County Health Department. Um, then again, you can also go to the city of Missoula's website for more information about this, that, and the other upcoming agendas. Um, I didn't say it during the city council report, but like always, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful resource for upcoming meetings, current meetings, and past meetings, and their agendas, um, which also brings you a nice format where you can see the video, but also find the item in which you are interested in looking in deeper a little bit more from the city. Um, but other than that, let's talk a little bit more about MCAT. So more recently, uh, MCAT has been doing some sports with MCPS. Um, there's been a um, couple things here and there, but MCAT's been pretty consistent with uploading the videos on our YouTube and our Facebook page. You can find those um, if you log on to Facebook or you go to YouTube, you can find MCAT. If you could log on to MCAT TV Missoula, those are the key words to look for. You can find all those sports and meetings and all those things that we've been doing. So far, MCAT has been working with a couple organizations throughout the city of Missoula, the University of Montana as well, trying to provide programs and access for people to um, be educated and just learn about what's going on within the city of Missoula and also the community as a whole. Um, one of the things that's happening as well this um, Saturday is that Sasha Bell is a multifaceted performer and musician, most heard from her sweetly melodic vocals and instrument instrumentation. She is known for working in the New York uh, burlesque uh, uh, ensemble Ladybug Transistor and later with Elephant Six Collective member. Yes. Um, so you get to enjoy some of that stuff. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, a lot of great stuff is happening as well um, within the city of Missoula and MCAT. Um, the library, as I was always saying every week, I just want to give you more of an update of what's going on here. But um, the nice thing right now is that a lot of the hard hat wearing um, people and us um, having to wear a hard hat when we enter the building is no longer a thing. So it seems like a lot of the streamline of moving things in is looking a lot smoother um, as the construction, interior construction folks are starting to clean up and leave. Um, the dumpster is basically getting filled up. Uh, the outside porta potties are gone, so you got plumbing inside the new library. So um, a lot of this is speculation, but I've heard that um, it's going to be a mid-November opening at the library. The library is uh, hell-bent, mm -hmm. hell-bent on opening the library before the uh, 2020s end. The original date for opening was going to be in uh, June for the soft opening, and then there's going to be the grand opening in mid-July. Many, many, many uh, things happened and had to be pushed back further and further back each time. Um, and, you know, just to keep up with social distancing and stuff like that. But that's pretty much all I have to say. There's a, there's a lot going on. Um, there's always a lot going on. If you guys are interested in finding out more information about MCAT, you can go to MCAT.org. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph. Take care, guys.